All right, so we have a friend of mine named Keith Farron who is speaking today. If you were here, maybe it was five weeks ago, he, he spoke, and uh, if you were here, you remember that it was a great day. But something significant about Keith is he is our men's retreat speaker uh, this fall, so the end of September, so that's, that's coming up. So uh, with that as an intro, give my friend Keith a hand. <laughs> Hi. So uh, when Greg called me up, I don't know, I guess it was probably three months ago or something like that, and he said, hey, do you want to preach in June and preach in July and be our retreat speaker? And he like signed up all three at the same time. I was like, you don't realize how dangerous that is. I should, I should probably come once and kind of see how, how you like me or don't like me, but, uh, but it's good to be back. Last time that I was here, I had my, my aunt and uncle from West Virginia were in town, and my mom came, and my wife came, and a couple of my kids came, and today you just got me. So, <laughs> so everyone, my, my aunt and uncle have got back in West Virginia, and my Mom and my wife and my daughter are teaching Sunday school back at our church in Kirkland. And so it is good to be here. Also, the last time that I was here, I don't know, those of you that were here, you heard me tell this story about seeing these whales and dolphins. Remember that story? When we're talking about more than you expected. So it was the first week of the more than expected uh, series portion of this of this read through that you guys are doing and told the story about going on this boat out this whale watching trip with my wife and my cousin and his wife many many years ago out in the Nepali coastline and seeing these whales and you just kind of see them far off and then they started swimming and these few adults and these couple yearlings swam under our boat in only like 35 feet of water a few different times and the guides had never seen anything like it so they jumped off the uh, they jumped off the boat to take pictures with the underwater camera that I had and uh, and it was just this whole insane more than you expected and then as we're going back these dolphins were like jumping with the front of the boat like they do only in the movies right and and we wanted to get a good picture of it, so one of the big Hawaiian guides held my feet while I laid on the front of the boat and <laughs> took this whole thing. And so many people think that I'm exaggerating the story, but I, and, and I, had, I had emailed, I'm not the smartest guy you've ever met, I had emailed Greg the link to the folder that had the pictures from the camera, because to end that story, and then have pictures pop up on the screen. Pretty powerful. <laughs> and then I got to church and he said, you should probably include a link when you're <laughs> emailing a link. There's a, there's a whole very important piece to the emailing a link process. <laughs> I would completely skipped. So for those of you that were here last, last time, uh, they told me this was going to happen. This just vibrated in my hand, and I don't know if that's good or it's about to explode. So this was one of the pictures I took while my feet were being held. And uh, hey, my wife said to say hi, Greg. And uh, they went to elementary school together. And yeah, so these were the pictures. So we were so close to these whales that we couldn't get a whole whale in a picture. So complete craziness. So we got those five pictures. I mean, just unbelievable, this whole talk about more than you expected. It was good. So, so this week, I just decided to go with no slides of any kind. Zero. We'll just put those up there, and now we're done. Now, when, when Greg told me this week, the, the part that you are reading this week, it included the Gospel of John, which is the book that, uh, for those of you that weren't here last time, 
I've, uh, I saw a guy present the Gospel of Luke back in spring of, of 1993, changed my life, my course of ministry. For the last now 28 years, since March 3rd of 96, I've been doing some biblical storytelling where I travel around and, and tell the scriptures. And the Gospel of John was that book that I hung out in and so when he said you can do anything from the gospel of john and i'm thinking about this series more than expected that i decided to just go with the very very last chapter of the gospel of john now i would encourage you not to follow along yet i see people flipping around whatever people get really really caught up in whether i'm getting it right or not i don't, I don't know what translation you've got whatever comparing translations is great but Let's hear the story first, and then let's dive in and take a look at it. Father God, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. May all this be for your name's sake. Amen. Later, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, hey, I'm going fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat. But that night, they caught nothing. <laughs> Early in the morning, Jesus appeared on the shore. The disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? And they answered, No. <laughs> then he said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Simon Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, <laughs> towing the net full of fish. For they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, gave thanks, took the bread and gave it to them, did the same with the fish. This was now the third time. He had appeared to his disciples after he had been raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. A second time, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my lambs. Third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Now, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. He said, Lord, what about him? <laughs> Jesus said, 
if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the disciples, among the brothers, that this disciple would not die. Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Now, Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And if every one of them are written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Amen? Amen. Amen. Talk amongst yourselves. Amen. So, let me ask you, have, have any of you ever experienced a miracle that, like, miracle, miracle, you go, oh my goodness, I can't. This was something that people ask me, have I ever experienced something like that? And, and I can point, whenever I read John 21, I can't not think about what happened to me in San Vicente, Mexico. Back from 91 to 97, I had the honor of being a youth pastor at a church in Tacoma, and we went on a couple mission trips, and one of the mission trips that we went on, we went to San Vicente, Mexico, and which is in the Baja, and, and we went there and we did a construction project there, built a house, and then we also ran a, a kids camp, a, a vacation Bible school, during the afternoons. And there was a lady there named Jeannie Sue Fegley, who, she was from California, but I can't say Jeannie Sue Fegley without a southern accent, because Jeannie Sue Fegley just sounds like somebody from the south. But she was from California, and she had just bought a, a mobile home moved down to San Vicente, and she lived down there and just served the kids in that community and had no, this wasn't a short-term thing for her. She moved down there, and she just felt called to love on these kids for the rest of her life. And so she was down there, and whenever there were groups in, they could run the VBS in the afternoons. But when there were not groups there, then she had kids over, and taught them about Jesus every single afternoon. Any kid could come by every afternoon. She ran a VBS without calling it VBS. She just called it Tuesday. And, and so we were down there that week. And I don't know if you've ever been on a mission trip. I know that last time, I want to hear about it. For those of you that went on the mission trip, last time I was here, you guys were like sending people off, I think the next day or something like that. So any of you that went on that trip, talk to me in between services. I would totally love to hear about it. But uh, so we... We're, we're down there, and, and as happens frequently on mission trips, the first day and the last day look a lot different as far as the number of kids. There, there will be 10 or 12 that showed up on Monday, and then the next day there were like 14, 15 kids, and then the next day a few more kids. And, and so we went days one through four of doing the VBS, and... Were, and we were probably had gone from 10 or 12 kids the first day to we had like 22, 23, 24, something in the low 20s of kids the fourth day. And so the, that, that Thursday night, we are, uh, we're making the craft, and we decided to pull out all the stops. We went with the greatest craft in the history of kids' crafts. The popsicle stick frame, <laughs> right? Who has had the honor and the privilege of hot gluing popsicle stick frames together? So has that job ever been done without somebody getting burned? <laughs> I don't know that it's possible. So we were gluing together the frame so that the next day they could draw the picture 
and then they could put the frame on there and they could go home with a picture and a frame. And so we put these together. And so at the end of the night, we counted up how many frames we had. And we had 39 frames. So we're like, so we all gathered together and we prayed, God, we prayed for tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be our last day with these kids. We've only had 20, up to 25 or so, but we pray that tomorrow you will bring 39 kids. That you would bring 39 kids tomorrow to VBS. And we're praying. The next day, we go and we're in Jean. And so Je the way that it's all set up is Jeannie Sue has her mobile home and she's built a picket fence around the outside with one gate. And at the end of the, the VBS, she would sit in a chair by the gate, and the ki she knew every kid in the town. So as kids would go out there, her one gate, she would check off who was there, and she would check off two more items. One, did they eat the snack? Because for some of these kids, it was the only thing they were going to eat that day. And did they have their craft in their hand? Because she didn't want to clean up. <laughs> right? You go, <laughs> it's a really, really good move as you go into uh, Mega Week next, <laughs> next week, just to have the kids leave with their craft in their hand. So she would check off, snack, craft in their hand, and they would leave. And I'm telling you, as this VBS is going on, there are kids coming out of the woodwork. There are just so many kids. We are blown away. And we play the game, and we talk to them about Jesus, and we do the craft. And then kids are leaving, and at the end of the day, I'm on the other, one side of the yard picking up, you know, balls and toys and stuff, and Jeannie Sue's sitting by the gate, and all the kids are now gone. And I, and I yelled from the side of the, the hill. I said, Jeannie Sue, how many kids did we have today? You know what she said? 46. <laughs> she said, 46. I said, 46, holy smokes, did you, did you get the names of the kids who didn't get a craft so that we could mail some stuff and make it really special for them? We really want to honor those kids since they went home without a craft today. She said, every kid went home with a craft. And I said, no, you don't understand, Jeannie Sue. We only brought 39. Do you know which kids didn't get a craft? She said, Keith, every kid got a craft. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. We only brought 39. And she said, no, Keith, you don't understand. God happens to be bigger than you. <laughs> and I crawled under a rock. And, just hung on. and it was something that had just, it was more than expected. More than, not only expected, but more than I could ask or imagine as Paul writes in Ephesians 3. And so, when I look at John, you can see why I can't read John 21 without thinking, of, without picturing that backyard and me humbled by my lack of faith that God is actually big enough to continue to do what he's been doing. And I look at John 21 and I, I feel like there are several different lessons that we can learn from, from John 21. I look at, I look at this, this story, and, and it just, it, everything about this, the first part of the story, kind of from the time they go on the boat till the time that they get to the shore, everything about this is just kind of crazy. I, I, and it was one of those things where I remember when I was reading the Gospel of John over and over again back in 94 as I was internalizing John and never having a clue that God would ever have me present it to people. But I remember as I was thinking this, I felt God kind of in my spirit ask me one day after I had read John over and over and over again and had seen all the different miracles that he performs in there and all that. And I, and I felt God ask me, do you know why I did this one? And I didn't have an answer. I mean, think, I, I just want you to think for a second. What, why do you think Jesus did this one? 
I mean, it's a cool miracle, but it's not his best. Right? I mean, I mean, we're only a chapter away, right? It was John 20 where he conquered death. So I'm thinking in the world of miracles, fish, the conquering of the grave, right? So it's not like it just blew everyone away and he was saving his best for last. So that can't be it. It can't be, well, maybe it's so that some people who had never seen before, who didn't believe, could be led to faith. Except that doesn't fit because there were seven people there and all of them were already disciples. And this was the third time they had seen him. So they'd seen him two other times. And so it's not to convince new people. I'm like... And then all of a sudden there was one line in John 21 that made me go, I'm not going to like bank my theology on this but I think I I I think maybe maybe Jesus did this one because it was fun (laughs) maybe because there's this one little line when these guys go out and they fish and then Jesus says hey you got any fish they say no and it says Jesus appeared on the shore but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus I'm pretty sure that John 21 is a practical joke. <laughs> because of a, a, any practical jokers in the room? Anybody like your practical jokes? Yeah. Who's, who's not raising their hand? Who just, and their, and their spouse just elbowed them. That's you. Yeah. And uh, the best time to play a practical joke on somebody is when you know the whole situation and they don't even know it's you. Right? That's the best time. And so... <laughs> We've got Jesus on the shore. He's got seven guys. He knows exactly who they are. He knows what they're going through. And they don't even realize it's him. And so he asks them the one question you never, ever, ever have to ask a fisherman. Right? Have you caught any fish? Any fishermen in the room? Right? Yeah? Couple? If you're fishing, does anybody need to ask you that question? No. No. Because if you've caught something, you're talking about it before they ask the question. And if you haven't caught anything, you don't want to talk about it. So don't ever ask a fisherman, did you catch anything? They don't want to talk. They'll tell you if they have. And so then, this this is where everything just kind of starts getting crazier and crazier. Jesus says, okay, I want you to go on the right side of the boat. And can you just see the conversation in there? Oh, that's right. All night long, we were going left. (laughs) <laughs> what? And so, but anyway, they do it, and then they catch so many, they can't even haul it in, and then they recognize it's Jesus. John points that out. Peter decides, I'm going to go swimming. What should I do next? How about put on all my clothes? <laughs> so he puts his outer garment around him. Have you ever gone, anybody ever like fallen in the water or gone swimming fully clothed? Not a fun deal. Go do that for 100 yards. And then the other disciples... It, they, there had to be, these guys have been friends for a long, long time, which means they were just ragging on Peter while this is going on, right? Because they're following along with him. They all arrive at the shore at the exact same time. You know that there's no way that six guys are in a boat with one guy swimming fully clothed and they're not like ragging on him. It's just, it's the way, it's the way we guys work. And, uh, and they arrive on the shore and we know they got there at the same time because Jesus says, hey, bring some of the fish you just caught. Peter's the one who climbs aboard. And so he gets, climbs aboard. He can't, they have 153 fish. I heard, <laughs> I heard one pastor preaching on this, and he goes, you know why that at the very beginning of the chapter, why he names five guys, and then he says, and two other disciples, and he doesn't name them? It was just John being nice. Because those were the two idiots that thought the best thing to do was to count fish when they're in the presence of Jesus, whatever. And so they count 153 fish. And then somehow along the way, in the time it took them to go 150 yards, somehow Jesus has a charcoal fire burning and fish already cooking. So picture that. I don't know what that 100-yard 
time took like, but at some point I'm thinking Jesus made eye contact with a couple fish in the water and said, sorry guys. I don't know how that whole thing worked, but the whole thing is hysterical to me. I think one thing that we can learn, if we not only look at how John ends, the last miracle he shares, but also the very first miracle he shares in John 2, is the water to the wine, so that a wedding celebration can continue. He bookends this with reminders that Jesus wants our life and relationship with him to be awesome, to be a blast. I think that's just one. I don't think that's the main point. of the, I, I think that's one lesson that we can learn of the many from here. Here's another. You see this conversation that he has with Peter. You all know the parallel. Peter has denied Jesus three times a few chapters earlier. And Jesus says, do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? You know all things. Yes. Hear this clearly. Jesus is more concerned with your present obedience than your past failure. Some of you are sitting in this room having not fully said yes to Jesus because in the back of your mind, the enemy of your soul has gotten you to believe the lie that the truest thing about you is your sin, that that's who you really are, that your failure is your identity. But hear what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The truest thing about you is not your sin. The truest thing about you is that in Christ you are and are becoming the righteousness of God. That is the truest thing about you. Did it ever pop into Peter's mind what he had done? Did he ever regret it? Sure, he was human, no doubt about it. Did he dwell on that and make it his identity? Absolutely not. Because after John 21, we see the book of Acts. And what is Peter doing? He is preaching. He is moving forward. He is building the church. He is going. He is leading people to Jesus because he had experienced for himself the truth of that statement that Jesus cares more what he what Peter learned on that beach that Jesus cares more about your present obedience than he cares about your past failure amen should be good news if you hear one thing this morning hear that and then He says, okay, follow me, right? And what does Peter do? Peter does what we all naturally do. He turns and finds somebody else and starts playing the comparison game. Right? Well, what about, what about John? (laughs) Jesus is like, dude, have we not just had a powerful moment? Right? I mean, (laughs) what, really? No. Here's the deal. Jesus cares more about your personal commitment than your personal comparisons. You must follow me, Jesus says. Is it wonderful to do that in community? Absolutely. Is it something where you need to be, what about this guy? What's his journey going to be like? What's what's her story going to be? Jesus is like, if I want him to remain alive, who cares what I do with him? I care about what you're doing. I I just read somebody, and I wish I could remember who it was so that I could give them credit. I just heard somebody say this week, comparison will always lead to either pride or defeat, neither of which gives glory to God. Amen?
And then John ends his book by saying that if all the world, I mean that if every story of Jesus was written down, the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. You know why? Why would the whole world be filled with the stories of Jesus, what he's doing? Because your story is not done. And your story is not done. And your story, ma'am, is not done. And your story is not done. And you over there, your story is not done. The conquering of the grave and the fact that Jesus is alive, he's still writing stories. Just that today's story happens to have your name on it. Next time you read John 21, I pray that you are reminded that life with Jesus isn't just right and good. It is, and it's also awesome. And I pray that you will remember that Jesus cares more about your present obedience than your past failure. And he cares more about your present commitment, your personal commitment, than your personal comparison. And then I want to encourage you. Write an amazing story with Jesus. Live out a more than expected story. Don't settle for mediocre when Jesus is, all, Jesus is offering amazing. Amen? Amen? Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you have done and continue to do and will continue to do more than we ever expected. More than we could ask or imagine. We thank you that it is not our failures in the past that define us. It is the continuous sanctification of our present and our future and the calling to eternal glory with you that define us. We thank you, Lord Jesus. It is in your beautiful name that we pray. Amen.